in the early 2000s, I came across a tape called Rolf Harris Teaching Kids to Swim. Uh, <laughs> swim, <laughs> swim Mates. And okay. there was something weird about it. And I lent it to a friend and her house was broken into. And in the early 2000s, tapes were still worth something. So someone stole her tape, the tape. And I could never find it again. So ever since then, I had an, an, an alert on eBay and Google searches for Rolf Harris Kids. <laughs> 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 Hello and welcome along to the Community Notice Board. Uh, all right, let's do it. Hello, welcome to another episode of Community Notice Board, a podcast about suburbs we grew up in, local landmarks, hometown heroes, and coming of age tales. We got a very special guest today. A very funny filmmaker who's been involved in some of Australian comedy's best TV programs, and now he's entered the arena the lucrative arena of podcasting <laughs> with his new podcast, Film vs. Film. It's very good. I've listened to the first two episodes. They are out now. Craig Anderson is in the studio. How yes. are you, Craig? Hello. I'm well. Thank you so much for having me today. Mm. Um, Thanks for coming in. I, I appreciate this uh, studio. It's very yeah. nice. It's raining outside. You wouldn't know it. No, no being absolutely in here. not. Uh, yeah. Very fancy. Very cozy. We did add the roof a couple of weeks ago. Uh Earlier Zero. episodes, no. <laughs> 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 we tried to record uh, outside for a while, but uh, no, it's very cozy in here, and um, yeah, we're excited. So, where where are you from, Craig? Where what the area? I uh, was born in Blacktown Hospital in the western suburbs of Sydney, mm -hmm. and then grew up in a, a suburb called Saint Clair, yeah, which is between Saint Mary's and Mount Druitt. Mm -hmm. um, in Western Sydney, uh, you know. the, the M, the motorway, the M4 goes mm. uh, through just on the one side of us, and then that splits us in a town called Colloden, and that's where Mount Druitt and St Mary's are near the train line, but we're further away from the train line. Right, it's beautiful. It's one of the most detailed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you drop a pin on a map right now. <laughs> well, it's, it's halfway between Blacktown and and Penrith. Okay, so, um, and most people only know Penrith, maybe yep. because there's a football team, mm. and then some people know Blacktown. Yeah. Yeah, I mean Mount Ruitt has a bit of a <laughs> name value as well, you know. <laughs> it's getting more and more. Uh, no, it used to be much. Uh, you would be scared, I guess, in the nineties. People from Mount Ruitt was meant. It was um, a rough place, I guess. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's not rough because I grew up... Well, no, I've been mugged there several times. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't lie. Um, like, home is safe behind the doors, but yeah. then outside is always a little, yes. little nerve-wracking at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Mount Druitt became like a punchline more than anything. I think I remember it was on the footy show and it was always a bit of a Mount Druitt. Like, I didn't... You know, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think it was a place... Because it's not like where people would go and visit if you weren't from there, right? Like, it's not like... No, there was no city, tourist... So. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. At Mount Druitt. Um, there was a Mount Druitt market town, big Westfield type mm -hmm. shopping centre. Uh, but apart from that, St Mary's, no, no, nothing. Uh, Penrith has a museum of fire. Yeah. So. <laughs> Every time I drive out to the Blue Mountains, I see that and I want to pull over and, and check it out because I'm just baffled yeah. by what's going to be in there. No, it's disappointing. It's firefighting. Uh -huh. um, and uh, not, not, not what you hope it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just yeah. get in here and you're like, man, yeah. it's hot. Uh, <laughs> oh, you guys are against fire? <laughs> <laughs> I hate this. Just, <laughs> you're walking through the hall of big lighters next. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, um, that's Mount Druitt had a reputation. It still mm. kind of does. Um, there's a bunch of kids out now, uh, rappers. <laughs> Oh. You ever heard of rappers? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a one. It's a one four. One four. Oh, yeah, yeah. and and the term everyone uses is the area. Yeah, which is all around area. Rudy Hill and yep. towards Blacktown is the area. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big uh, First Nations population out there, and in the '90s and backwards, it was it was stigmatized the way Redfern was stigmatized yeah. in the inner city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, for, for for that. Right. Um, but there was, in 1995, I think, uh, uh, my last year of high school, there was a news report came out <laughs> and the Daily Telegraph put on their front page that Mount Druitt High School was the dumbest school in the state. <laughs> 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 yeah. Wow. And it was very disheartening for everyone out there because um, I wasn't at that school. I was at the one in my suburb, but it made everyone feel terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, nice. yeah, and it was kind of reprehensible uh, because... I think they were trying to make a point, but in a way, like negging uh, and dating, <laughs> you know, like trying to neg to say, nah, come on, we should do something to help the school. But instead, they just made everyone yeah, go feel like an a idiot. horrible punch. It's like some, some school has to 
be have the lowest scores in the state. So what's how what sort of <laughs> news article is this? You know what I mean? Just it's just put it front page. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. Leave it alone. It's, it's not. Know? It doesn't yeah. mean it's actually anything. even worse than Craig is describing it because no. you mentioned it on your podcast, yes. and so I immediately researched it. It was in 1997. Oh wow! Uh, the Telegraph, the headline. The front of the pe- the front page of the paper, the class we failed, <laughs> and basically they say that no student in year twelve in Mount Druitt High School scored high, scored a tertiary entrance rank above fifty, <laughs> and then so in addition to being like yeah. no one scored above fifty, the front page photograph was the photograph of the entire year of 17-year-old mm. students with faces unblurred. Oh so it's God. just like a major metropolitan newspaper goes out around Australia, yeah. look at these dumb cunts. <laughs> Here they are. Wow. That's what it that is. Fun. Like, it, it was, it was gross. Very yeah. um, harsh. It was, it yeah. was rough. And yeah. so like Craig said... You know said, when you'd have to look up the paper to see what score you got? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have to turn well, it in. Well, it came out papers. at that time, I think. It was like, here's yeah. your scores. Yeah. That's, and then, yeah. So basically what Craig said is true in that they were negging them, essentially. The point <laughs> is that the newspaper's <laughs> article is like, the state has failed the students. Look how stupid <laughs> they are. <laughs> Here they are. We photoshopped dunce hats on their heads. <laughs> yeah. And so the, the, the claim was that Every student had failed to get over 50. This claim, wildly incorrect as well. Like oh, good. People had passed, and a lot of people... The TER, at this point, I believe you could elect not to receive it if you thought you were going on mm-hmm. to do something else. Yeah. And a lot of people were just like, okay, I'll bypass it. I'm going to get a job doing Tape this. Yeah, yeah, get mm-hmm. a job doing this. So a lot of the students sued the Daily Telegraph. This is in the wow. Daily Telegraph's Wikipedia under their controversies section. Oh. <laughs> Always a great section for old community notice <laughs> board. Have you got to spare four or five days to go through the controversy <laughs> section? I'm sure it was yeah. pretty meaty. So students sued because like many had achieved actually quite a bit higher than 50 and some had not applied. And so the defamation suit, they won as well. These kids, they won. Wait, so the... Uh, the paper just made it up. Well, I, I think Obscured like the, the result. Basically, the results were bad, and they were in the bottom school. But to go with a sensationalist headline, it was like every single person failed. Yeah, right. When okay. the truth was somewhere <laughs> very far away from that, yeah. and so, like Craig said, kind of leads to a lot of anger and hurt in the community. The principal of Mount Druitt like says like no, like she came into it basically a little bit after that and was like, no community needs to go through the hurt and anger that she came into because she starts working at the school and they're like, okay, so what are the biggest problems here? You know, like underfunding and they're like, well, every student has their picture published on a (laughs) major newspaper. You can find it. And so it it led to like a discussion about league tables of schools and the rankings that they get. And for a while they were demolished, but they have since again reared their ugly head. But that, Mm, yes. um, Those league tables were an important big thing because we all knew at our school, I was one of the only (laughs) academic kids. And my podcast is actually with two Guys, two twins, uh, uh, a twin. I don't know what the is there a plural? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they plural? two guys who are twins. Yeah. Um, who we were very concerned with academia, and they were very, very. Sm- one's the professor at Sydney Union Film now. He got ninety three, and I don't think there was any other way to explain what happened. Um, other than that he was graded down. And I tried my best. I got 57. <laughs> Luckily, I could get in through audition into acting school and stuff. Mm-hmm. But he had to go through, like, that was it. There was, like, a real upper limit no matter how hard we tried or... Yeah. yeah. It was just, like, the school... They just assumed, oh, they... Yeah. Yeah, they, and it was from aware. There. Yeah, and then the fancier schools get the, the mark range where yeah. you can actually hit the top and stuff. Jeez. Yeah, Which is weird. I've never understood how that works... Like they, li- it's literally a grading on a curve where you're like, oh, you're, mm. if you're at this school, because where I grew up in Queenbie and down in Canberra, we oh, were yes. one of the, um, we had a similar thing except we had no photos, but the Daily Hel- Daily Telegraph headline was roughest school in New South Wales because <laughs> <laughs> like some teacher got the shit kicked out of him by a student, uh, and that was when I was in year twelve. But yeah, similar thing where it's just like, hey, by the way, you're never gonna get higher than this, but some private schools got you know, of course, the dumbest yeah. person there is still getting like ninety, yeah. Maybe. And they not and that the, it's all the um I saw that you know how like at um when you do your HSC or whatever if you have like special needs as in you've got a bit of dyslexia or something um you get extra time and you go into a separate area I read something that like all the private schools are coaching their kids like to to basically say they have 
you know, a migraine or something to get the extra time because they're all just co- – they all know the ins and outs of it all wow. because it's just Got competing. It. Yeah, just a game. And yeah. so they're like the, the most disadvantaged school in terms of like kids who have – Reading or writing problems are like this ridiculous private school, and it's only because of that. And it's like Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so you know, good luck to anyone. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I bet um, the high school had a hell of a footy team though. Uh, Mount Druitt did. Um, uh, there were a few other suburbs around there. Dunheaven. Uh, what was the? Uh, they were all good. Our school, uh, good, but we were not engaged in that. My nerdy friends and I, we mm-hmm. were in the library and missing out on the sports stuff, but. They all, yeah, it was the primary concern of everyone was yep, um, yep. football <laughs> yeah, and, and sports. And, I mean, we weren't rejecting. We'd watched the State of Origin and, you know, we had our teams, but we did not um, hang out at the footy field. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, and, yeah. And so you went to – because I, I um, like, saw that, you know, Jamie knew you and brought you on and, and he said, oh, you did this show Double the Fist back <laughs> in the day. And I'm like, Double the Fist? What uh-huh. a fucking – and that was, like, the – that was such a huge show. So that was your first sort of break into sort of... Yeah, yeah. I success. went to uni out western suburbs and then I um, made a film for a thing called Trop Fest that doesn't exist anymore. Big short film festival. Yep. Uh, shot out at Prospect Reservoir out in the western suburbs near uh, Blacktown. I'd met a guy who'd come from Kayama and we made short films using video VHS cameras and plugging them into tape players and hitting pause. And the, the short film was like a joke about... Uh, people not doing well, like so. It was a series of outtakes, like button on, button off, and people argue. Me and him arguing about how to do it. Mm. And we won Trop Fest, and it went. That was ninety nine, and then ABC eventually had a friend of ours doing graphics, and we started making little bits for them, and that's how we made a show called Double the Fist, which was sort of a satire of extreme sports. And in two thousand and three, sort of when we started, that was a huge. Uh, it was reality like a jackass TV thing, thing. Yeah, jackass. We like jackass. You know, genuine. Like, oh, that's funny. Um, but also, just programs on TV when reality was being born were somewhat intense and extreme. Mm. And the, mm. our favorite one was called "When Good Times Go Bad," and it was. <laughs> 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 that's a great title. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> it was a sensationalist. It was like, um, you know, the Speedway, like. Welcome back. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. like um, they thought they could have a picnic, <laughs> but then it turns out that a, a hang glider gets stuck yeah. on a pa- uh, electric wire. Uh, above yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> like, and that was the whole premise. So they were trying to work out the most um, uh, TV friendly ways to show extreme content. And yeah. so we started the our show Double the Fist was let's be a bunch of jackass type guys, but because we can do visual effects, we'll blow up. Mm. Almost, you know, every time we'll cut ourselves in half. And <laughs> and it was great. We, that was our first thing. It was yeah. very... It leaned into a Bogan aesthetic. Mm. Um, I played a character called Steve Fox who yelled a lot. He was a bit like Alex Jones or... Back then there was a guy called Stan Zamanik. Mm-hmm. On yeah. the, uh, I remember yeah. Stan Zamanik. Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was, you know, just like a know-it-all who would then change the rules when he doesn't get his way. <laughs> yeah. And that kind of thing. And then I would be the, the host who just yells at the screen a lot and then the three contestants would try and do various challenges yeah. and always get hurt and blow up or die or hate each other. and it Yeah. Was, and it's then we, crazy to watch because the visual effects were so, like, gr- groundbreaking <laughs> for TV, right? They, like they were. We got nominated. Well, we, we won an actor for the, just the best comedy show, which was good, but we beat Kath and Kim, so we got into a lot of trouble at the ABC. Yeah, um, I heard about that. Everyone yeah. was really mad. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, people are mad that you made a good shot? I uh, know, it's hard. But yeah. it's uh, at the time, Kath and Kim were nominated in Best Drama TV because there was no comedy category. So they kind of invented one just for them. And then the following year, John Safran beat them. <laughs> and then the final year that they'd made a show, we beat them. And so everyone was like, what? And they were so annoyed. And we got on stage <laughs> and some of us swore. And so then that kind of damaged our career for a while because yeah. uh, we didn't realize you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed um, to beat Kathy and Kim, which I assume to, yeah. you didn't even have a choice. Like, you just no, no, you know we, what I mean? Unfortunately, we just made the anyone. best show, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but ever because I read about it because it's like the AFI, right? Is it AFI? What yes, was it was it? clear, which is now called the Actor Awards, Actor Awards. AFI, but so. but basically, everyone was like, What's this stupid? Show on SBS or ABC, ABC. that ABC yeah. that like mm-hmm. you know, and someone said it was the biggest joke of the whole night was that you beat, them. <laughs> and like, like people were so upset about it. It was so ridiculous, <laughs> and uh, but that would have been interesting going up and just 
to uh, hail a booze or whatever. Yeah, no, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I read here, I don't know if it's true, but you uh, you sort of leaned into it. You had like some uh, excerpt from your next season where you were like, uh, basically said, if you want to make a box set for Double of Fist, just get a Kath and Kim DVD, take the uh-huh. take the cover off and sort of like tear yeah, it up and stuff. Yeah, then we'd smash it with Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it didn't go well. Uh, people really like Kath and Kim, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but that was like that was yeah, that was pretty groundbreaking, and that was all Western Sydney Uni. Yeah, guys. we shot all around out west. Um, by that point, I think some of us had moved into the western suburbs. I was still living in Kingswood. I was out there lecturing at Western Sydney, and so we would just sort of meet always in the middle, somewhere around. But also, are out there, no one checks and no one thinks you're doing anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we weren't a big film crew with many trucks. We're four dudes with a camera and a tripod. and So we just set up anywhere around there and shoot stuff. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was good. And also, growing up out there, when you live in an area like that, uh, your days or weekends, you either go to the club in the city or you're just hanging around, driving around at night in the middle of, you know, checking out every possible area out mm, there mm, and just yeah. seeing what's around and going oh there's a bridge no one uses let's go there and pretend to jump off for a sketch and <laughs> 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 yeah so we had a lot of local knowledge from that area yeah right mm. no it was, it was great when i yeah i like used to watch that and oh uh, you, so you saw it when it was on yeah 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 ah, I remember. it was it was great i can't i couldn't remember i remember there was a character there was another because you were fox and there was another guy who was yeah. like a or a helmet or something like that. <laughs> I can't remember. I, I, I remember watching, I was talking, trying to tell yeah. my brother about it. Um, but yeah, no, it was like, a, and just the graphic effects, I was like, what is this show? It was just so weird because it was mm. just so like filmed very low budget and sort of you guys running around. But then it had like literally like movie quality special effects and explosions and graphics and everything. And yeah. Yeah, it was, it was stupid. We didn't get paid properly to do it, but we also could do the visual effects. The guy who played a character called Mephisto. Mephisto, <laughs> um, yeah. He, he, his name's Doug Bain and he's very good. That He did all the effects. Right. But he'd also, we'd also work backwards. He said, I could do this and then we'd sit around and work out the scene and then we knew we had the one shot that would be the funny joke and the rest of the scene was a, a reason to do it. Yeah, right. And then he also started to teach us how to do it, and we learned how to do it from him. He was, he's great. He now works with the Umbilical Brothers um, oh, wow. on their latest stage show, which involves lots of cameras uh, and screens, and the, the, the Umbies perform in front of the cameras, and then Doug live video mixes in what you should be seeing. Right. Which is kind of not the point of mine. He's sort of <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's doing what they do best. But now <laughs> miming an object and just inserting yeah, and it. Now in. he's putting it in. So what's the point? <laughs> 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 but that's the he's he now does that live and he loves that um, wow. challenge of trying to do those visual effects in a live environment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Tricky. So you're saying like working back. So you go to him. What can you do? And he's like, oh, I can fucking cut a bloke in half. And yeah. then you're like, All right, well, we got to figure out the stunt. The yeah, yeah. So you know, he goes, Oh, we can rip someone arms off you know and then <laughs> you can do this but the arms will be gone like, that's funny and we go what about fishing off a bridge and that you catch a car but then your arms get ripped off and he goes yeah and then we just work it out and i'd go fishing is one of the weakest sports in the world you know <laughs> <laughs> angry about fishing and then i go i challenge all three of you to go out and find the best way to fish and then we one of those would be that and another yep. one would be just dive off a ferry and try and br- come up with as many fish as you can get. You did, know, did you ever get the about. ABC ever push back on anything? Or was it too graphic? Well, when we there? first started, it was a, for <laughs> Sunday morning or Saturday morning links um, between cartoons. And so the only time we got pushed back was when we gave <laughs> fake advice. Um, <laughs> and some of, the, some of the stuff they let to air without thinking um, because it didn't really affect any law. So if we, we couldn't put blood on screen, but we could rip arms off if you didn't see blood. <laughs> but like I could go um, get angry and say, this is the best use of a fire extinguisher and throw it off a, a building, an eight-story building, and say, aim for cars. <laughs> but because I was sort of being satirical, they said, well, there's not much we can do. Mm. And we go, but it's still G-rated. So they put it to air. And it's like, I don't, editorial didn't really step in, right. which is the people that are meant to say, we shouldn't give that advice. <laughs> but at that time, no one was thinking kids shows are going to be given that kind yeah, of advice. It, so. so it wasn't even, it was actually during kids programming. It wasn't yes. that just it was G-rated. It was Yeah, and it was edge. like, coming up, uh, this and then this. But for now, have you ever thought about and then just get stuck into something that's <laughs> 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 not allowed? Yeah, yeah, building? things like that. Jeez. So we got into a little bit of trouble. Oh, and the worst part was 
it was a very what would you call it extreme like jackass and bogan mm. uh, aesthetic <laughs> and uh the fans uh, sometimes we're not sure they understood that it was a satire that was the yeah, saddest right. part mm -hmm. um you you'd, we for season two we bought a um giant uh tractor like a monster truck type car like a big tires that we turn into a thing that can fly and we went to buy it off of and he goes i'm a big fan and when we met him he, he lived in the shire and he had a hitler mustache <laughs> 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 and, he, and he wasn't ironic and he didn't mention it he just oh had a hitler God. mustache and a weird <laughs> undercut but longish hair on top which i'm sure he could Turn into a side part at any minute, oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. yeah, and uh, he was a strange character. Apart from that Hitler mustache, he was also like extremely scared of his dad and on the edge. And his dad was like, we had to ha wait around with him for like half an hour while his dad went and got the keys, and we never saw his dad. It was like really, uh, and that, but he loved the show. <laughs> but it was disconcerting because we were like, yeah, I think some people don't understand that we blow up, so therefore. This isn't real, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that isn't always an, a, a good enough excuse for people. They just go, yeah, they can do anything nowadays. It's bloody awesome, mate. You know, because like, you oh. always talk about fist worthiness, right? Yes. Yeah, so there was a code in the show of um, <laughs> if you do well, you get the full fist. Um, <laughs> and there were, I don't know, we never really leaned into. We looked. It was a Shakespeare term because we were all nerds from uni of <laughs> acting, and double the fist means to do that. But um, in it, like close to, your fist, close yeah. to double over, and and we thought that's funny because it means you're about to punch someone. Yeah. Oh, but right. um, a lot of people, <laughs> especially once the internet was developed, would use it as a search term, and it would mean fisting <laughs> and, and double yeah. searching. <laughs> there was another Not Shakespeare's um, intent, I imagine. In the noughties in America, it was also meant to hold two beers, like mm. you were going yeah, hard, yeah, you double got fisting. double fisting yeah. beers. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we also learned that there were a lot of other search terms, <laughs> which we ended up just having to go. We got to lean into it. There's yeah. full fist, and if you're weak, there's no fist, and uh, <laughs> there was a lot of yeah. yeah. So people would yell at us on the street, full fist, uh, or <laughs> double the fist, or stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, uh, most of the fans were good-natured um, <laughs> individuals, and just the occasional just Hitler mustache, <laughs> 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 or, or drunk people. Um, who would be waiting for Rage to start? Because they put it on just before Rage. Because before uh -huh. um, streaming and digital channels, they were trying to hide this show that they'd <laughs> made. And that was the best time they figured, Friday <laughs> at 11 o'clock. I imagine there must have been like one or two people at ABC who loved it and then everyone, like executives and everyone well, else hated it. Yeah, Do you absolutely. Know what I mean? Yeah, no, we had the whole entertainment department thought it was excellent and were always pushing it. But they were always like weird outsiders. And, you know, um, they, th they understood it and thought it was funny. And then they put us... <laughs> Landline was the show that went on before us. Um, <laughs> late, no, Late Line. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. it was kind of like, oh, okay. So Late Line, then Us, then Rage. That was kind of <laughs> good. But everyone who'd seen it had said, man, I love your show. I get, uh, on Friday night when I come home drunk, I put it on. Yeah. yeah it was yeah, very yeah. sweet. You're connecting with young people. <laughs> 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 I think with comedy, like, and specifically satire, there's always that double-edged sword of like, you know, you meet a fan and they're like, hey, you, you actually blow cunts up. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, I'm so disappointed that this guy doesn't realize what we're doing is satire. But they walk away being like, oh, I'm so disappointed this guy's just a nerd. You know? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, he's talking about writing and how it's a shake yeah, 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 yeah. I thought it meant to hit two guys at once. He's got double the fist tattooed on him. <laughs> and that's a fucking Shakespeare. Yeah. I think that's that so happens funny. maybe with comedians more than anyone else. Because, like, mm. so many times, like, like someone would leave a pub and they'd be like, fuck, he didn't talk much, did he, when he was off stage? And you'd be yeah. like, yeah, he's trying to get a beer with his friends, man. He's not going to spend the next <laughs> half hour doing crowd work on you yeah, like, yeah, afterwards. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about something else because obviously you spent a lot of time cruising around Sinclair and you mentioned this on your podcast, one of the places you hung out or was very formative for you guys, especially as future film academics and makers, was a video store called Grogan Flicks, I believe? <laughs> yeah, man. Um, at Colliden, it was called Grogan Flicks. And G-R-O-G-N mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Flicks. Mm. So Grogan Flicks. So it just it sells beer and yeah, movies. Yeah, it was a warehouse. Um, oh, man, I can't even describe how dodgy this warehouse is. <laughs> it is, uh, yeah, similar to a barn. It was just old, open in a car park next to a hotel. Um, and it was one of those hotels where dudes would finish work, uh, get drunk, and then get a room for the night and just crash for like 30 bucks or something. Yep. And this place had a lot of wine and beer and then a back section, which was full of videos. And I mean, 
um, the average blockbuster might have 8,000 videos or 7,000. This place had about 12,000. It was very big mm. and it was very spread out. And so as kids, we would go there a lot because we loved it. And you'd walk past the smell of broken bottles of, you know, alcohol everywhere. But then we'd just go around. And it was also really grimy. It was ne They never dusted anything. They, they, it was $7 for seven tapes was the um, oh. the special, which we loved. That's great. Um, and then new releases were 3 or $5. And, you, yeah, it was just a real pleasure to go to this place. And they also had a lot of um, – I'm a VHS nerd. I have collected. VHS, uh, I got ten thousand VHS tapes in my collection. Like, oh, uh, wow, a real problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but as video stores were closing around this country, I would drive to them and hang out, make friends, and then end up buying a bunch of their stock. Yeah. And my goal was always to find things that aren't on DVD or now digital. And so I've got a lot of strange products, I guess, films. Um, but there was a thing before nineteen eighty seven called pre certificate, and in the UK. They're worth a lot of money to collectors. It was the time where they weren't regulating films. And so a big famous expression from England is video nasties. You might have heard of it. It's a, it's a reference to um, this woman called Mary Whitehouse, a big right-wing Christian mm -hmm. activist who shut down the nasties, the videos that were nasty. Mm -hmm. And some of them were things you've heard of, like Evil Dead 2, you know, yeah, that yeah, was a video right. nasty. But then there was like Cannibal Holocaust mm -hmm. or um, I Spit on Your Grave yep. or other... Rape, revenge, uh, cannibal, zombie, um, things that look as if they're real snuff films snuff and stuff. stuff yeah, yeah. Right. and they've all become very famous. And if you own the cassettes, they're worth hundreds and hundreds. And a lot of people trade in that. But Collard and Grog and Flicks had a lot of those. And they were called pre-certificate, meaning before the rating system started to do that. Right. So that video store was full of excellent pre-cert uh, tapes like zombie and, and also, the back then, when they weren't regulating, the covers could be as explicit as you want as well. So mm -hmm. a lot of the pornography was just <laughs> extremely explicit covers. And then, like, there was Double also... Double fist. You, you were, <laughs> I was going to say, you would know from Queen Bean Living, uh -huh. which was on the edge of, like, near Canberra, Fish Week, yeah, and yeah. where there was... Because in this country, that was the... Um, Canberra allowed X-rated pornography mm, um, yeah. to be sold, whereas here it was a special you-must-order-it type yeah. of thing. Mm. And so video stores would never have X-rated. They'd only have R-rated. But at Grog and Flicks, you'd see X-rated. Everything. Nice. Yeah, Caligula was a famous film that had a yeah. few different versions, and the nasty was the X-rated one. Yep. So I don't know how boring, <laughs> how much of this you need no, to no, know, it but uh, it was a <laughs> was fascinating place. And you were, there awesome. un you were there as under 18 or as 18? Oh, no, under 18. I was, um, you know, like the porno section and the horror section were just as open as the kids' no section. One, yeah. really no cared. one cares, and everyone else is getting drunk out the front or yeah. grabbing. <laughs> so the kids would, everyone would just walk around, and you just walk down these and aisles. did the bloke who owned it, was he just this, like, film buff? Guy, no, or he just was like, this it was, is a it way was to strange make money. because, and I learned this from going to a lot of video stores. They were usually just going, there's a uh, business opportunity here. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Watt, a famous one in Bondi uh, video store, that guy was sort of into film, but very cynically, not a lot cynical, but when he left, he had it for like 30 years and he just opened, he had a winery up in the Hunter Valley. But he had famous customers. Jane Campion would come in there and cool. George Miller and people like that were coming in to get tapes from him and he'd sort of enjoy that, um, you know, being connected to cool, famous people. Mm. And then he'd always drop their names into every conversation you had with him. <laughs> he goes, oh, yeah, Judy Davis loves that one. Yeah, all right, Neil. <laughs> but it was also just a thing of, well, we need a business and this seems to be a thing. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah It was always a little disappointing when you found out that the people that ran the video stores weren't so much into film. Yeah. Is that a bit is that a bit in contrast to like vinyl stores where they would be more it would you know what I'm I think so say? now, yeah, because well if you went to a VHS store now that existed, um, not that there are many, but there are collectors type places, those people are very nerdy and very educated on the entire history and what every tape means. Mm. Similar to if you go to a vinyl store now. Mm. But if you went into a Brashes in the eighties, it might just be some random that goes, Yeah, it's a good job a good business you yeah right. need to buy the franchise stock. yeah right, and right, and right. also a lot of that was sales reps coming in with booklets saying this is going to go great for your business this 1987 summer this is the time to have dirty dancing on tape you're going to need you know yep. and it would just be sales pitches look at the numbers and they go mm, okay i'll get five copies it was all about stock and trade and it wasn't so much about oh it's a good movie yep. yeah 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 
Sorry, <laughs> disappoint you, but <laughs> no, no, no. But I think kids like me who grew up in the eighties and nineties and have a memory of tapes, mm. we're the ones that have developed this weird fetishization of VHS and also DVD, and want to know about it and have mm. gone and researched and learned. Yeah, it's it's strange. so every time you hear about a VHS store shutting down, I mean, mm. a, you know, a blockbuster, away, which I imagine there mu- probably isn't many left, There's but let's none. say the last 10 years, yeah. you would go and do a bit of a fire sale. Yeah, I would, uh, you know, I'd call up every suburb if I was going to Adelaide, I'd call every suburb that I knew I'd be driving by or, or within like 200k radius and say, do you have any VHS tapes anymore? Wow. It started when at uh, uh, Penrith in, um, in ni- uh, 2000, the year 2000 in Penrith, I remember the first time I'd seen VHS tapes for sale instead of, and it was the same to buy them as it was to rent them for two dollars. I was like, "What? <laughs> Hang on, I can buy these tapes for two dollars?" And they were funny, you know, Richard Pryor, Gene Wilder films. So I was like, "Oh, I haven't seen Silver Streak. Okay, I'll buy it and don't have to return it." And it was <laughs> such a weird concept because we loved film so much all through the eighties and nineties that the thought of getting it for the same price to rent it, but now you keep it and watch it any time. Yeah, I kind of became addicted, and yeah. then over the, the following twenty years, I would be calling video stores and finding what was open. And then I'd make, oh boy, make relationships with some of them who were slowly closing but still had tapes. And then I became a friend of collectors and I kind of learned, oh boy, collectors are, I guess it's, I don't know if you guys are similar, collectors are kind of nerdy and a little, mm-hmm. um, a certain type of person. <laughs> and yeah. uh, they, they can become very precious about things mm-hmm. and, and a, a singular focus on things yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. not wash properly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the blooming, the early blooming stages of vinyl collection. And I mean, my wife, she doesn't mind at the moment because there's mm. not too many. But when it gets to 10,000 and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, we need a storage thing. She, mm. We need a storage thing. And she'll be like, no, no, you need to live in a storage. <laughs> <laughs> need to I know it because I know like when I, we moved out to the house we're in now, I used to have like tons of CDs, just like tons and tons of CDs. And she was like, we got to get rid of them. And I was like, oh man, what a bummer. And I eventually just ended up like donating them to council and wow. stuff like that. But now... I've gotten into vinyl and she's just slowly sees and she's like, is that just a CD you had 20 years ago that you've re-bought for twice the value? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> on a, yes, on an is. older technology. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If you just spent $50 on an emo album from 2004 that you already own, yes, yes, I have. Don't leave. <laughs> so you, how many VHS do you have? 10,000. 10, I mean, I probably bought about 13,000, 14,000 over time. Um, then I, I did a big cull and now I'm down to my eight, the 8,000 I think I should have, but I had to move Frame out of the this. crop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't live without these 8,000. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting. I had to move out of this big warehouse I lived in. Um, they were knocking it down. So I put it all in a shipping container and I'm so surprised at how little I care now. <laughs> like I'm, it's bye bye. Like yeah. I, if the, if I open that one day, uh, it's in storage in a big warehouse. If I open that container and it's all gone, I'll be like. Oh, well. Right, right. But for years, I was so obsessed. But I had made a, a video store. I'd put them in genres and bookshelves mm. and walk around. And that was the joy of it. People coming over, walking around, picking a tape and going and watching the VHS. And, you know, mm. it was just a lot of... And it was... I, ha- I saw a lot of films um, as a film lover that I'd never seen before. Yeah. And nowadays, some of those come out on Criterion and you go, oh, so that's how important that was. Because it looked like a dodgy VHS. And yeah. when I watched it, it had the trailer for... Total Recall in front of me. You know, it didn't seem to matter, but now it's very fancy film. And it was cool getting to watch a lot of movies like that. See yeah, the history of it and have it on tape. Yeah. 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 Would you ever uh, consider the crown jewel in your 8,000 strong collection? Uh, <laughs> like if someone was, if you're like, you got to fucking see this one. Depends on the person. Oh, yeah? I'd be like a sommelier. What do they call them? Uh, sommelier. sommelier. Yeah. 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 Um, um, yeah, I would... There's a few standouts that are, that were big discoveries. One was a, a taxi driver knockoff mm-hmm. made in the early 90s, and it's called God's Lonely Man. And it literally is just taxi driver but shifted to L.A. And it's got a Travis Big- Biggle. It looks just like Travis Bickle character. I, I, he's busting up a he- heroin thing, but then it turns into not prostitution but rather a child porn ring. And it's just a fascinating, like if Taxi Driver didn't exist, you would watch this film and think it was amazing. Mm. Mm. Like it is a real, ma- I'd call it a masterpiece. I think it's excellent. And I, I tweeted about it when I first watched it. And the filmmaker contacted me because 
he didn't know that, um, and this often happens in the VHS trade, no one knew that in Australia someone had bought the licence after it premiered in, in um, Sundance in 96, I think it was, something like that. And then someone had bought the licence just for Australia, printed off 100 copies, and create, I've got two of them already. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the yeah, others yeah. are probably in a garbage bin years ago. And then he's gone, how did you see this film? I'm so excited that someone has seen my film. And I was like, man, I, it's excellent. I think it's fantastic. And we you know, talked. And another one with uh, someone, Avery, Roger Avery or someone like that, who would written with Tarantino, had made this ridiculous film called Skins, like a bad thriller horror thing. I think it was called Skin, something Skin. And I, again, tweeted it, and this, the guy reached out and said, how did you see this? This is amazing. So they, they were fun discoveries making connections wow. with the filmmakers. Yeah, that's awesome. But then there were just awesome films from the 70s and 80s that had been forgotten. I, I, one of my favourites was Dealing. Um, sorry, it's called Dealing or the Boston to... Uh, uh, it's a very long title, <laughs> but it, it's it's like a, a shipping of uh, drugs between one place. But it, it, it's counterculture film, like a yep. like an early seventies thing. Uh, but the crowning jewel, or the most engaged I was, or the uh, biggest experience was, uh, I in the early two thousands I came across a tape called Rolf Harris teaching kids to swim. Uh, <laughs> Swim, swim mates <laughs> and okay. there was something weird about it and I lent it to a friend and her house was broken into and in the early 2000s tapes were still worth something so someone stole her tape the tape and I could never find it again so ever since then I had an, an, an alert on eBay and Google searches for Rolf Harris kids <laughs> <laughs> Mark pre <laughs> And I didn't know at the time because it hadn't come out, but he is uh, now arrested and in jail yeah. for being a pedophile. Yeah. Um, and he's all part of that, you, the the British, you know, S Jimmy Savile mm. bunch yeah. of dudes. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then a tape came up uh, in about 2011 called Rolf Harris, Kids Can Say No. <laughs> and it was him doing a tape about how not to get molested. Oh, my oh God. God. Oh. And it, it was $130 uh, from a library in Adelaide. And I was like, okay. And, I, of course, I bought it straight away. And then within six months, the big first and, and you uh, reports came out. And you weren't uh, – because I don't remember, but was it was it were there rumours of Rolf Harris well, being like that? This is the thing. Six months later, the first rumours came out that right. they said – a, an Australian expat celebrity has been arrested or has been taken in for questioning. We, we're not allowed to say who it is. And that was where all the rumours... And then I heard from in the industry, people, uh, makeup artists would say, oh, yeah, everyone used to call him the octopus. And I go, why? And they go, because he'd, his arms would be everywhere when he's in the makeup chair. And I was like, oh, man. So it's likely that... And they go, oh, yeah, it's definitely Rolf Harris. And then in the following two, three years... It was, you know, he went there and they could finally say his name. And on the day they could finally say his name, I had this tape, which is a 20-minute tape, and it came with a printed out in full scap, which is the type of paper before A4. <laughs> and it's it's a different shape, and it would have asterisks. So it was like a study guide for teachers. And they would pause the tape when on the screen it went to yellow stars. But it was creepy, and someone once told me, a VHS collector, he had probably been busted by the cops, and this was made in 1985, and the cops had said, you need to do something to correct this. <laughs> oh. So he made this tape to correct it, and it blew <laughs> my mind. That is a wild <laughs> and it's, story. And it, and it features recreations of evil men being creepy. It features him sitting around with a group of kids, grabbing at him and going, no, nah, you won't like it if people touch you like this, would you? <laughs> and it's like, oh, no, no, oh. Rolf. And you could tell from just watching the tape that it was all rotten and weird. Oh. And, yeah, there's just th – at the end there's a big song and police come in and stand next to him and they all sing together, <laughs> it's my body, you, not your body, you can't touch my body or something like that. What the oh. fuck? And it's sort of like him knowing and the police knowing and it's like this is rotten, this whole – 20 minute video is wrong. Yeah. It's and good. so I had that and there was no other copy. And so the Guardian and the Daily Mail contacted me and had said, can we get this? Can, how do you? And I go, I, I'll show you. And I put a watermark on it and I showed them a clip on Vimeo and they went, yep, we want that. And they were going to give me big, big money. But then someone went, we can't just get it from a random dude in Australia. And they went to the person who made it and she sold it to them, the rights. And so then my copy is the only copy that exists. And then she only sold certain clips.
So if you want, I can send you that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would that kind love of, uh, to see that. Wow. Yeah, it's the, it does spine tingling yeah. stuff. Yeah. So did you ever... Yeah. Um, did you so you never got the swimming one? Like, did you ever? No, I never that? got the swimming one ever wow. again, and it breaks my heart because I think that one very clearly is a document of, you know, horror. Mm. But the swimming one just had I felt even worse things where you could kind of see his grooming process at work, oh. and and he it's true in the fifties he was a national swimmer. He swam for Australia over in Perth, mm. but the the advice he gives out is ridiculous. Like at one point he goes. All right, and he's standing in like mid waist there with kids, water, and he goes, I guess, and this is a, a genuine advice on how to save your life if you're drowning. He said, get your T-shirt and try and get some air in there. And he does it to a kid. And as you can imagine, a cotton T-shirt just gets wet and no good. And he goes, so that's one. And he's just <laughs> improvising. <laughs> it's an hour tape where he's improvising shit. To, but the, the excuse is he's just hanging out with kids in a pool. Oh, It's man. really we- not, that is not good. so gross. No. It's so, an incredible story. Oh, though. Yeah, that's oh. For a minute, has, I was almost certain you were about to just launch into a bit because it has all the cadence. Oh, and no. you were just like, <laughs> Rolf Harris, kids. I was like, ah, he's fooling us. But no, no, it's no, all it's, real. It's unfortunately that's so, real. That's unbelievable. Yeah. What a story. Oh, and uh, can I tell you one more VHS story? Oh, if you absolutely. Please. Love yes. to hear it. There was, um, I, I was, I became friends with collectors and uh, there were forums and we, you would sell them and people would put their things on eBay. And one man kept s- trying to get this film called Crackers, an Australian movie set at Christmas and the cr- Christmas mm-hmm. Crackers. And it's dreadful. You know, it's kind of like the castle, but it's like, let's cash in on the castle. Yep. And I think maybe Glenn Robbins is in it and... Uh, you know, it's not great, and, and there's no reason why anyone would want it. Anyway, this man would constantly try and get the tape. And some people, he was obsessed with that and a couple of others, like Ken Russell's Gothic and uh, what, uh, what was the other? I can't remember the other. But there was, and so with amongst the forums, people going, hey, did this bloke try and contact you for another copy of Crackers? I told him I've already sold him to. And they go, I don't know, yep. And then it, everyone started saying, and after a while it became a real point of, uh, well, not contention, but interest why does this guy want crackers and i had three copies of it so <laughs> and i was like should i try and sell him one and everyone started to go what if he's done something on the tape oh no and he's trying to get them back and that's when everyone went oh that's probably what it is what if he recorded something over the film crackers because on the old day you'd go to a video rental and you could put a sticky tape over the spine, the bit on the spine, and you could record whatever you want. Mm-hmm. And so there were, you know, modern day pranks back then, contemporary pranks of recording voices over the top of Shinless, you know, laugh yep. tracks, the famous stories of that, or just ridiculous. Someone had taped a football game over the top of your copy of Remains of the Day, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> but what if he'd done something on a tape? that was a copy of crackers but then someone's donated it so now he's constantly paranoid that this type of evidence is out in the world so then it became the biggest thing in the world for everyone to try and work out what what he had done and recorded that he needed to get back so desperately because this was for years he was trying to get this film back and so we came up with this idea in my warehouse that why don't we sell tickets on ebay to a screening of crackers played off a tape live (laughs) And we thought we could play all three copies at once <laughs> on a machine. And now we never did it, but I kind of wish we did <laughs> as a way of making him, because we thought if we're playing the tapes live and he knew there was an audience, that would make him have to turn up <laughs> 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 to stop the tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we could finally say, what do you know what about it? What the hell did you do? Yeah. yeah. Damn. So it's a bit of a mystery we've never quite wow. solved. That's a uh, great VHS unsolved mystery. Yeah. <laughs> so well, he's, yeah, so he's, if anyone listening mm. has copies of Crackers, crackers on VHS, uh, <laughs> watch <laughs> them again, baby. <laughs> well, maybe it was Glenn <laughs> Robbins who was embarrassed about <laughs> the movie. <laughs> and he's like, get it off the fucking... Yeah, Jesus <laughs> Christ. That I, is I might be misrepresenting. It might not be Glenn Robbins. It might be, um, was there someone called Elliot? Eli- uh, he Elliot did the Goblet? E.T. No, he did the E.T. Um, well, that was Glenn Robbins. On, uh, I'm talking to younger people. Don't worry. He did <laughs> yeah. a thing on Hey Hate Saturday all the time where he pretended to be E.T. Oh. Um, Here we go. Crackers movie. Yeah, that's the, who's the cast there? Daniel Kelly, Warren Mitchell, Terry Gill, Peter Rosethorn. That's the uh, Peter Rosethorn. Oh, yeah. he's, uh, he's in Kath and Kim. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Oh, there you go. (laughs) Bring it back. Yeah, I'm unfortunately I haven't seen Kath and Kim. (laughs) 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 I was going to say, if you did in your um, VHS adventures come across 
two movies, mm. uh, Young Dragons 1 and 2, which is the, <laughs> like a Chinese version of The Three Ninjas. With yes, the, the little kids, yeah. I've been wanting to find that. I used to rent it from the Queen Bian Civic Video every every weekend. And wow. And now, I, like, I haven't seen it in years, and I loved those movies. I we were literally talking about that two weeks ago. Yeah, I can't stop talking about it. I am well, just going to look up. I, mm. I cataloged them all before I um, finally left my warehouse. Um, oh, it's got an official name. Young Dragons. I can't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was no way that was not going to be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so, fortunately, I stopped. Um, <laughs> Young Dragons. Okay. Uh, the Would it... The Young Dragons? I think it was just called Young Dragons. 1986. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, it was like an 80s movie. Oh, yes, I have it. Oh, my <laughs> God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I gotta, you got to digitize it's got, that it's got, a, it's got a Chinese name, which you're welcome to have a go at. <laughs> it features X's nope. and Z's. <laughs> yeah. so. That's the one. Yeah. I love this movie yeah, so okay. much. Yeah, no, As I a kid? I like, loved it, yeah. When I was like was 10 years old, because I love ninja shit. Yeah. And, that was, and I loved the movie, the series, The Three Ninjas, with the, the American one. And then I saw that and was like, oh, this is... Sim, like looks similar, and then yeah, that it's way better than the Three Ninjas. They, these kids were all doing backflips and shit. <laughs> I don't have the sequel. I only have the first. Oh, one. that's all right. yeah. far okay. out. <laughs> that's a start. Yeah. Um, I did want to bring up because you you know you mentioned driving around and you know sort of the lay of the land. Mm. Um, this is a a famous landmark, but I guess it's not there anymore. It's apparently it's a um, it's a a derelict garden center now. But in the eighties. There was a place, and we one thing we do love on this podcast is like an urban legend, yes. and this this was like a famous um, sort of setting for a, an urban legend, which I think they have around the world, but for whatever this, reason, is this waterworks? It is, this is waterworks, yeah. baby. Mandra waterworks. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I so, went there all the time as a kid. Well, did you ever hear? Because apparently there was a big thing um, where people would say, if you slide down yeah. it, there's razor blades in <laughs> yeah, there that yeah, cut yeah. you up. So what you would do, well, not me, but what the rumor was, a kid would go down wedge themselves in um, kind of like Indiana Jones or James Bond, spread themselves out mm. into a, 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 a four V shape mm. to then get into the roof and put chewing gum with a razor blade yeah. oh. um, into the thing, or they try and fit a razor blade into the join. Mm -hmm. So you'd always be terrified when oh. sliding down that you'd come across <laughs> this razor blade. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, the, but the Mount Rom <laughs> it is now like a gardening dirt soil they've taken where the pipes used to come out and just put soil there and trucks <laughs> back up and just collect more soil or drop off soil it's quite sad but i loved it there were more manly had one as well in the 80s there was mm -hmm. the manly waterworks and the mount Druitt one and the manly one had mm, two or four slides whereas mount Druitt had six uh, maybe even eight slides and a white water rapids oh nice it was so excellent to go there was this <laughs> <laughs> I'm misrepresenting it. It was Mount Druitt Waterworks. It was dreadful. But for me, <laughs> as a child, it was the best yeah, place on earth. Water yeah. park near your house. And then when you look at photos from when you're a kid and you see yourself there, you go, oh, where was this? Did we stop off at a public school? And they go, no, no, that's the waterworks. <laughs> oh, okay, it's sad. And But there was like a little beach area and everything was brown um, tiles. The, the, the whole place was made out of brown, uh, brown gutters, brown paint, brown everything. And then, yes, you'd walk to the top of the hill where the slides were. And it was a, it was a, one of, a favorite place. But it was also like fancy. You know, you didn't always get to go. And this was long before um, Australia's Wonderland opened, which was another mm -hmm. giant place out there. Mm. And that definitely put the nail in the coffin for the waterworks. Yeah. There was a, a similar place. Um, <laughs> or the razor in the coffin, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, a similar place called Magic Kingdom, which was also out there. Um, I think it's in Preston's. And that was also another great theme park. We shot our second season of Double the Fist at a place called O'Neill's Adventureland, which then doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> but we used the giant slide and turned it into, we called it Prawn World in our show and put a visual <laughs> effect of a, an old rusting prawn. <laughs> and so, it but it was still full because the guy who owned it would have carny rides there. No. So we'd use a lot of the carny rides in our shots. And, yep. and, right. and, and it was as if our characters had moved into an, an abandoned amusement park. Yeah. It's cool it. when you can't tell the difference in name between an amusement park and an Irish pub. We've got O'Neill's over here. <laughs> O'Neill's <laughs> eventually. Um, there was also uh, El Cabello Blanco, the white horse, <laughs> which was out near, well, it's Raby now, but... Uh, uh, Norellan, yep. uh, uh, Campbell Town, and an excellent one near us in Ludnam called Nostradamus. 
Notre okay. Dame, um, which was not no Notre Dame, and it was like a castle. Some crazy man built a castle out there in the rural area, and had a zoo. And um, in the <laughs> in the zoo, uh, he he ran out of money eventually. So there were lines and all types of stuff. So one morning he just woke up. Undid all the cages and shot everything. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and uh, well, when the shooting started, all the animals started going nuts. So I remember um, hearing reports of, like, rumors of a a panther escaped, and, and uh, which you know led to the whole, amongst other Penrith Panther rumors. Yeah. Mm. Um, but then also just that the police rocked up and there were wild animals walking around, and some had just been shot dead. God and this Lord. guy was just roaming around in his like dressing gown with a shotgun or something. Fucking Jesus Christ. Sound of horror. <laughs> so, <laughs> just no <laughs> rules in the 80s. Yeah. You can just set up a castle, <laughs> shoot Weird. a lion. Weirdly enough, every time doing this podcast, you find something that you think is so unique, and then it has happened, because we have done an episode in a suburb before where a guy's just like, fuck it, I'll build a castle and charge people to come here. Yeah. So it's not... It's, not, it's uh, pretty common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> a, it's, it's an sh- epidemic. Wow. <laughs> I, I love Garfield. going back. Though, no animal murder in that one. But, but uh, I love the going back when you're an adult to the place that you, as a kid you think is like majestic. Yeah. And because mm. I remember when my grandma lived in Coffs Harbour and we used to always go there, and there was the pet porpoise pool. And to me, as a kid, it was like <laughs> Sea World. Yeah. And but I went there recently, drove past, and it's a fucking above ground pool. <laughs> like seriously, it's like literally like a above ground pool that's like twenty meters by twenty, and they just had like two porpoise, and they would throw fish to them. And I was, it's Aww. just, yeah, it's just around. the weirdest thing to go back. I'm like, how? Why would my parents take me here? You know, it's so weird. But I, yeah, I, I, your I, parents I are probably like, why is he so fucking excited about <laughs> yeah, this yeah, above yeah. ground pool? I oh, know. <laughs> uh, but um, I wanted to just bring up one thing about um, about St. Clair, which is mm. a bit – it's a little bit – and you mentioned um, – uh, the, what's the rap group there now? Around one, one four. four. <laughs> but it is actually the, the home or uh, one of the birthplace of Aussie hip-hop. The first ever um, – uh, one of the first ever Australian hip-hop albums ever was recorded in St. Clair. Wow. Um, uh, full, full – you know, what do they call it? LP? You know, the, yeah. the full album anyway. Be- Def Def Wishcast. Have you guys ever heard of Def? They're very like this is like 1992. Wow. Um, it's very Beastie Boys like, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's 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 very. Um, and then the first ones to ever have like, Aussie accents. It's it's less corny than it should be. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it yeah. should be very lame. Yeah. But it's it's you know it's very early. But um yeah they recorded an album there, um in some one of their house they lived in Sinclair. And they recorded an album, and the album's called uh, what's the album called? It's the one of the lamest. Uh, it's called "Knights of the Underground Table" by Def Wishcast. That's the album cover. Have a look at how <laughs> that's a little bit corny, and look at the uh, the axe and everything. Wow, it's very like um, Young Dragons, Wu Tang, Wu Tang inspired <laughs> Beastie you get this Boys. True. <laughs> um, it's it's very like corny and lame. Oh, it's kind of Wu Tang clean. Wu Tangy, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Finally mastered hip hop rituals. Yep, that's cool. yep. Um, yeah, yeah. But very, but the yeah. sound is more Beastie Boys than yeah. um, that. But it yeah they they recorded in one of their album uh, their houses um and then they started opening oh they've got a track called AUST um so it's very Aussie like there was another <laughs> album released by another band about uh, nine months earlier but they were um just American accents indistinguishable from you know this was the first Aussie uh, track AUST and there's a whole bridge that's like St. Clair's in the house, <laughs> St. Mary's in, in the, the house, house. <laughs> Mount Druitt in the house, and Penrith in the house. Like it's, you know, it's, right? it's pretty cool. So, like, so um, can we find it to take this episode? Yeah, out? probably can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and but they started supporting international acts, and they 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 got famous from it. Um, Beastie Boys, um, Rec. Um, Rex and Effect, KRS One. Wow. They, they, oh, wow. they they supported a, a band. This I got on a tangent here, but they they opened for a, a, a hip hop crew from New York called Young Black Teenagers. Five members, none of them black. Wow. <laughs> oh my <laughs> god! <laughs> With their hit single "Proud to Be Black," <laughs> which was uh, some might say that I'm whack, and some might say I act black, um, which is black for a fact that I'm proud to act black. And this is just five white guys. Five white guys. Oh, wow. my God. Which is unbelievable. <laughs> so I was a bit like Aussie hip hop's lame. And I'm like, oh, American <laughs> hip hop at that point was also pretty lame. And also, side note, and, uh, uh, you know, 
let me just say, so Beastie Boys, they, these guys are inspired by the Beastie Boys album Licensed to Ill, mm -hmm. the first platinum of our rap record to go, uh, first rap record ever to go platinum. Um, but I didn't know this because I was like, you know, clicking through it and Licensed to Ill. I think that's a, like a great album name, Licensed to Ill. Really no, cool, you're you know. going to do mm -hmm. the original one. Do you know what it's called? Yeah, yeah. I've, got, got, the, I've got the Beastie Boys book. No, I don't want to say the word. <laughs> <laughs> so the Beastie Boys originally wanted to call it don't be a faggot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? That was their wow. original wow. name for Licensed And they got Ill. talked out of it by their record company. Oh, what a so, uh, visionary. <laughs> I know. And uh, so I was a bit like, you know, going into this like Aussie hip hop, oh, roll your eyes. And then I'm like, everyone back then was a little bit lame. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Skeletons um, in the closet. There. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so anyway, that was, yeah, literally in some, one of the dude's house. I don't know which one and I don't know where, but they recorded that. Damn, and, bit uh, of history. So in 90, uh, 92, 93, 92, you would have probably been I was around. in year 10. Yeah, um, you been I around the corner probably wouldn't have been connected with any cool kids like that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly but i'll play the track on the album yeah, it's, very, it's very um yeah like i said it's very yeah <laughs> corny <laughs> but uh, yeah but still a bit it's of great. history there you go i yeah. should say uh, when i was younger and uh, excited about where i was from <laughs> um and i also so i moved to kingswood and became a lecturer at western sydney uni because i was very nerdy about anthropology and, and performance studies would study things i'd gotten into and went uh, like as a subject. Mm. And so I stayed there for way too long until like the early 2000s before I finally left and came to the inner west and became a wanker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <but Yeah. laughs> back then I was like, what What do the suburbs mean? The meanings of their names. So mm. St. Mary's was named after a woman who, um, because that the train line stopped at St. Mary's when it was first built uh, coming from the city. And there was a tannery and it had been around for a, a long time, the town of St. Mary's, as had Mount Druitt. And St. Mary's, there was a woman called Mary and she was very saintly to all of the, uh, the people who worked out there and were not rich um and so that's how it got its name same kingswood was because there was a king family who lived in that area and they owned uh, the the big woods near the train line uh mount Druid, i think was named after someone in penrith rudy hill no sorry in england as was penrith uh mm. rudy hill is literally the hill there that is rudy um emu plains and emu heights was because they spotted emus there mm. But then I was so upset uh, uh, to find out that <laughs> St. Clair, when I finally tracked down its name, it said St. Clair was named by the Landex Corporation in 1980. <laughs> 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 that's such a that's disappointing <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, For resolution. someone so interested in all that stuff. No, I know. Well. And it was so sucky. And the, the only thing I remember that's even better than that was that there was a sign when we first moved into the suburb that hung around for about 15 years that are just off the freeway, like in Back to the Future, you know, one of those signs. Mm -hmm. And it said St. Clair, the garden suburb of the 80s. <laughs> but it was an implied, come on, everyone, get behind this, because there was no gardens there. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. was literally just a plain, it's like, um, it's like know, a mad a grassy plain. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. My parents got into it, though. They built a lot of garden and stuff, but most of the houses around me don't have great gardens. <laughs> um, mostly car rusting cars <laughs> yeah. make up their gardens. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, Jeremy, we, we have, yeah, two final questions, Craig. First, someone says to you, I'm going down to St. Clair for the day. I need an itinerary, something to do morning, afternoon, and night. What do you tell them to do? Or where do they go? The, the whole area, Yeah, right? it can be Mount Druid, the whole area. Wow. Okay, there's a... Uh, <sighs> Seriously? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Mamre House is Mamre Road is a, one of the big roads you might see on the way out. Uh, there is a house there with the horses and it's apparently old. Uh, <laughs> people go there and that's a place I can say, if you're not going with me, go there. <laughs> but if you're going with me, I'll drive you around um, yeah. and just tell you everything. Mam there's the Melville Road shops, uh, the kind of shops you expect in a lower socioeconomic area. And are fascinating to visit mm -hmm. and just sit out the front of for about half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a good place to go just for people watching and um, uh, that's not a good thing to say, is it? <laughs> 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 I once buried a fire extinguisher under the freeway bridge there. I'll take you there and we can try and dig it up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Banks, Banks Drive, there's a basketball court just been put in um, recently and I turned up there on a Sunday morning because I stay out at my parents' house often and played against a guy who I'd gone to high school with but had totally forgotten about. That was nice. So I'd say go and play some basketball. Uh, oh, man, you're pushing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the blue, I never the went 
the, the Blue Cattle Dog is the name of the pub. Oh, um, yeah. Sounds like a good uh, And I see, I would direct you to the video stores. Mm. Yeah. If you listen to my podcast, it's full of all the memories of old video stores and old cinemas that don't exist anymore. But the, next to the Blue Cattle Dog is a shell, and that shell service station used to have about 150 tapes on the wall. And that back in the day, in the early 80s, that people weren't sure what to do with these new movies that you could get everywhere. So anyone would be renting them. And the Shell service station rented videotapes. Oh, and right. I used to yeah. always get Michael Jackson's Thriller, uh, the making Classic. of, at that, at that Shell server. So you go there in St. Clay's Shops, there's a Red Rooster <laughs> and a McDonald's and uh, oh. you probably get well, nails. One there. of the pubs I did find, which I like just speaking of you know, 80s movies, mm. there was one called Uncle Buck's Hotel. Oh, oh, really? Oh, yeah. I love Uncle Buck. Oh, I don't remember Uncle Buck's that. great, yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, I couldn't find where it was. I was just trying to find funny reviews. Well, there's <laughs> St. Mary's Band Club is out there, and that has a buffet. And I think a buffet always sets a town into a certain situation. It's either the highest of high fanciness at mm. the Sofitel in the it, city, yeah. or it's the kind of <laughs> suburb where mm -hmm. we had one at, called the Food Star Family Restaurant um, in uh, near Penrith. And one of their dishes was called meat salad. <laughs> <laughs> and it was literally a salad with bits of capsicum and the rest was just cold meats all cut up. <laughs> oh Worth a pun. Sounds pretty good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and okay, finally. final question, Craig. You've achieved everything that you would want to do with your filmmaking career, your podcasting career, oh, yes. everything you ever wanted. When all is said and done, would you settle down in St. Mary's? Mm. St. Clair? Oh, St. Clair, sorry. Fucking... <laughs> You one. know what, uh, another day before they'd finished building that basketball court, I went to a place called Warrington, also on the same train line near there. And I was playing at seven in the morning on a Sunday. And I considered that question. I was looking at <laughs> because <laughs> two men in very short shorts were pushing a trolley from the uh, train station back to their apartments. And I was watching them and they were stopping and going through bins and... They got into their house and I saw one of them climb through a window that wasn't their apartment, clearly, and they were just raiding it for things. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, maybe I could... I was trying to... Before that, saw them. I saw another bloke out there just standing there staring off at, on his balcony and I thought, maybe I could live there. But then when I saw the guy stealing stuff, and this is out in the open in front of me just across the road playing on this a basketball court that looks... You know when you, the school oval goes bad mm. and it's just like this, the cement is being broken up by grass? Yeah. That's how this basketball court existed. And I was just playing on that and I was watching these two blokes with their trolley go through and just to help themselves to another person's apartment and load up their trolley. And I just thought, that, uh, that could be my life. So even though it's cheap, because I was thinking, what happens when I lose this room I'm in now and I have no money, I'm going to have to move out west. And I thought, could I do it? But every day it's unfortunate because... You don't get taught out west, well, where I grew up, to rob from the rich. You get taught yeah, the rich right. are untouchable. Mm -hmm. And you don't even know what the suburbs are or how to get to them <laughs> or that you're welcome there or that you're not going to get shot on arrival. You just learn to steal from each other and fight each other. It's kind of right. sad. I, yeah. I sound mm. like a crazy communist here or something, but it's true. It's sort of like it just keeps turning in on itself. Mm. And I imagine living there and I thought, imagine coming home and I don't have much. I'd, I'd probably have VHS tapes in there. But what if they took a shit on my VHS tapes or <laughs> stole some of them? How sad that would be. Because yeah. even there seems to be no value to that but then i thought oh i guess i just need a backpack i'd just be living with a backpack where everything i need has to stay in that backpack and i take it everywhere yeah the only, it would be a rough life but i guess i would thoughtful you pitched it very high like i have an excellent life and i could move in and be happy but i'm kind of aware of where I am in life. <laughs> <laughs> and in Maybe. that backpack, how many, you got crackers in there? What have you got? <laughs> got six copies. Six, six copies of crackers. <laughs> I can't let anyone see what's on them. <laughs> <laughs> and right. let's plug your stuff, Craig. Your podcast is called Film Versus Film. Yeah, man. It's uh, th two boys I went to high school with, very nerdy guys. They moved from Cape Town in South Africa. Um, they call themselves Coloured Boys because I didn't know this at the time. There's a difference between black and white and in the middle is coloured. It's this other class under apartheid. Um, they moved when, and we met in year four and became best friends and we stayed in friends th all through school. But our big thing whilst living in this environment was going to video stores and to the cinema. And we would spend recess, lunch and after school at libraries just talking about movies and watching movies. So now I'm a filmmaker. One's a professor of film and the other one is a massive library nerd. And the three of us meet up in this podcast talk about our growing up for like 10 minutes and then the rest of the time we compare two movies you wouldn't normally compare. 
So the first few apps are like Texas Chainsaw versus Parasite, and we talk about family. And uh, another one, we do Batman versus The Dark Knight, uh, where we go, Tim Burton creates this neo-noir magical world mm. that's very pure, whereas Nolan presents a world that's scared of everything and kind of aligned with right-wing politics. It's sort of very nerdy, but we just love movies, and mm. we also talk about growing up out west. So oh, yeah. Have a listen, film versus film, whenever you like. Oh, Perfect. Do, do you have awesome. anything else you want to plug? Craig? No, Any man. No, <laughs> no, you're all good. <laughs> go, to, go out west. Go yeah. Head out Check it west. out. I, 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 I want to speak up for something you could never have someone on because it's a cemetery. Um, <laughs> uh, you could never have anyone from Rookwood Cemetery unless you had like a priest or a, a groundskeeper. <laughs> but I love that place. It's the biggest cemetery in the Southern Hemisphere <laughs> and it's got its own postcode. It's wow. it's oh, it's that's... near Lidcombe. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the, every type of uh, religion is represented there and there is a heritage <laughs> sorry this is so weird to plug this but it's got a heritage section and to walk around that is glorious because it's like it's like you know like a zombie film because it's overgrown and land care is in charge of it literally instead of the the groundskeepers there and you can get a coffee and you can walk forever and never see anyone and you're walking amongst graves and there's a serpentine canal and there's old train lines it's just a fascinating place wow. it's huge very big and very expansive and if you find the right areas you can walk all day and have a picnic and I strongly recommend hitting up Rookwood, the Acropolis uh, Cemetery. That wow. sounds great. Yeah, that sounds I mean, so as well, like, <laughs> makes a good change from plugging Melbourne International Comedy Festival yeah, shows. Yeah, 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 yeah. Plug in the cemetery. Hell with that. Go and check out all the yeah. good stuff. Yeah. But check out all our stuff <laughs> online. Give us a five-star review on Spotify and Apple Music. And why... While you're at it, give a five-star review to Craig's new podcast, obviously, <laughs> and find us on all social media. We love hearing your tips and your stories and your little tidbits. And we also put the full video on YouTube, so you can watch us there. Apart from that, Craig, that was fascinating. Thank you. So funny. Thanks, guys. Good awesome. to have you, mate. And we'll see you next week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.